Corporation, our symposium. So the first speaker of today's uh, uh, talks is Fikuo uh, from University of Miami, who is going to tell us about linking mathematical problems to mosquito trap data. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a good opportunity for me to uh, present this work, which uh, like Steve is also a co-author of this work as well. So it's like it's um, uh, it's not a very theoretical mathematical work, but it's the fun project that we um, this is the first project that we are actually trying to link uh, the models to uh, the data provided by our ecology collaborators. So. Um, That phrase. Oh, just throw squirrel it. Okay. So first, happy birthday to Steve, and uh, uh, not only uh, to thank like uh, here's. I list you as the first one in my acknowledgement. It's just like, um, like you've been um, you've been doing all the work so that like our ecological collaborators they, um, they they always believe that uh, mathematicians can actually answer their questions. So that's why I believe they have the CDC grant um, happened um, like before I came in. But uh, but this is a. A super nice project that they uh, they were able to um, actually spend money and personnel on the um, collection of data and everything, so that we have this nice uh, mosquito data throughout this Miami Dade County, and then um, and then that makes everything possible. So um, so and then like here's a introduction about uh, our collaborators. Um, have people from UM and then like the mass biology group is in that, and also our uh, long term collaborator uh, John Meyer uh, is from the Matt. Uh, medical campus. Uh, so, and then uh, they are responsible for the CDC grant, and they are responsible for the data collected. And of course, we have our prior PhD student Jing Chen. Uh, she's in Nova, uh, and then she's like uh, providing a lot of insights about the statistical analysis over here. And also, we are. Um, uh, we're doing this work actually uh, trying to answer the question uh, for people coming from mosquito control de department of our county. So, um, uh, so those are the uh, people who are giving us insights about uh, what they're doing in the field. So, um, Seems like the connection is a little bit slow. So um, yeah, something about the um, biology is like the uh, the uh, the purpose of this project is uh, that um, it's originated back about uh, why we get the CDC program running uh, is like dated back to the 2016 Zika outbreak, and then uh, ADC is uh, species of mosquito that is responsible for the transmission of the Zika virus and also not only for Zika virus but also for dengue um, and many others which are like um, uh, in case you haven't noticed like we, we have local cases almost everywhere for dengue um, and also the Zika outbreak hit us really bad um, in uh, back in 2016 so uh, so that is when they start the CDC grant I guess so and they want to uh, get started and knowing uh, the dynamics of the mosquito population a lot more better in our county and they the major question of course they want to know like how they are uh, going to improve their vector control program, how what exactly they should do, and uh, like whether or not the current treatment methods are enough, and then um, and incorporating uh, the uh, mass biology group is like they, they want us to answer their questions, which are really uh, realistic ones, and then um, yeah, they they apparently they have troubles by just using the data to answer their questions, so. Um, 
Uh, so the thing is like uh, this. Um, this is only one part of our make use of uh, the data they collected in the CDC grant. But um, but also like uh, so something about this type of mosquito is like uh, you should be able to see that very often uh, in your home or uh, anywhere uh, whenever there are large number of population come moving around. And so this is a species which is majorly found in our county. And another thing is like uh, they uh, they are the major mosquitoes that are biting people. Um, so, uh, and also another reason is like uh, why, uh, why the uh, mosquito control people are very um, curious about is like, uh, this is the type of mosquito which is hard for them to eradicate or um, it's not possible for them to eradicate, but uh, it's hard for them to actually control their population. So reason lies in that is um, they, they do not breed in uh, like natural water resources. Uh, what they're doing is like they would uh, find any small water pounds available over there and to be able to lay their eggs and breeding. So uh, including your flower vases or tires, barrels or uh, empty beer cans and everywhere. So so then that also makes sense that you should be able to see them a lot uh, whenever there are a huge number of population living in the area. So um, so but but still like traditionally they don't have any novel control methods. Um, so the only thing that they can do is just to do the uh, spray of insecticides. So, uh, and also sometimes they could do some application of larvicide, so which are, means like they're going to put some pills in the water uh, and until the pill dissolves and there should be some killing possibility for the, uh, for the um, aquatic stage of the mosquitoes. So then that refers to the uh, current life cycle of mosquitoes. Uh, so for any mosquito, like they're Vaguely, you can dis uh, divide it in terms of two different age stages. So one is the adult mosquito, which are responsible for transmitting the disease and biting people, laying eggs. Uh, but uh, for the juvenile or for the um, like unmature mosquito population, they majorly live in water. So so that's why in terms of the mosquito control, they always talk about doing the control in two ways. One is like you spray this kind of adult side to get rid of the adult mosquitoes and the other ones like you uh, dissolve some water um, tap, uh, dissolve some larvicide in the water uh, resources so that you can get rid of the immature mosquitoes. Uh, but also there are like complicated uh, information involved because like uh, temperature and rainfall they're going to impact the mosquito dynamics a lot. So for example, mosquitoes, they have a different birth rate and death rate under different temperatures. So that's why you see uh, more mosquito population during the summer, but you see less during the winter. So, and then, um, and for rainfall, it's another issue uh, related to the specific species you're looking at. If you have more rainfall, you could have more uh, small water ponds around the area and then they would be able to breed more often. So, um, so, so this is the, like the general knowledge that um, every, um, every people working in mosquito control would uh, talk about. Um, uh, but I, I want to mention that like the problem is not that easy and um, uh, which I can talk, share that a little bit more when whenever we are talking about the uh, future direction. But uh, currently, major point is like you know, jet temperature and rainfall are super important. And then, um, and then like the major question still in mind is like they want to know how uh, their mosquito dyna population dynamics will change if you uh, use some kind of control methods. So, uh, but in terms for them to know whether or not their control methods are actually working, uh, they have to monitor the mosquito data points. So that's why they place those kind of mosquito traps throughout our country. So uh, throughout our county. So there should be more than 200 traps nowadays here. And if you want to take a look at it, there should be one in the um, law school library. So 
actually in the middle of the big tree over there. So if you look at that, that should be the trap uh, that looks like over here. And then, um, so what the trap is doing is like, it's just mimic uh, the breath pattern of a human so that they believe this is a way for them to attract mosquito uh, to come into the trap so that they can count. So, um, and then statistically speaking, you can consider this is like a sampling process. So you're just trying to observe a random amount of mosquito in the same area. So and then uh, and then another issue which is interesting is like uh, whenever you're attracting mosquitoes by using this kind of traps, you are only going to collect female mosquitoes because those are the only mosquitoes that are actually going to bite people, and they should be attracted by the trap. And then. Um, Another thing is like if you look at the map of how people place their traps, uh, it's like uh, I, I think it's supported by the CDC grant, so they have so many people working on it to be able to place the traps almost every corner of the important areas they, they can find, so there should be like uh, already two traps in our Coral Gable campus. And then, uh, but, uh, but they place these traps by uh, using the idea that they believe uh, the trap population should already represent the um, fraction of mosquito population in the local area already because they, they feel like mosquitoes don't disperse too far away in their lifetime. So, um, so, so then like, uh, you can consider that if you put a trap in the Coral campus, then that should be a good representation of how many mosquito populations you should see on the campus. So, um, and then, um, so that's like what they do um, in terms of the data. Um. Okay, so so here's about the more about the data, but here's exactly what why they need us. Um, so the thing is, like, if you look at all the dotted points, those are the representative areas that uh, they really want to take a closer look at, uh, because those are the areas. Like, three of the areas are those areas with uh, a lot of Zika cases found it. In, uh, back in 2016. And one area, which is Homestead, uh, like uh, they didn't find any Zika cases, but uh, they are wondering because Homestead is also an urbanized place, uh, but it's more like a, like a local community, but you don't see many Zika cases coming in. And then uh, they want to know what happens among those areas where you have Zika cases and where you don't have Zika cases. Um, and then the idea they, they think about is like, they, they think maybe there should be a difference in terms of mosquito population in those different areas. And then uh, they want to know how exactly the mosquito populations look like in different areas based on their trap data. And also they want to know like in terms of if I know the mosquito population dynamics, uh, what kind of treatment strategies I should use uh, in order to um, reduce their population and this in a way for them to uh, reduce any disease, like vector-borne disease risks in the future. So, um, but they do have certain kind of difficulties by observing this data points, uh, data traps. So uh, one reason is like, as I mentioned, there are 200 traps over there. They don't have so many people. They cannot do that every day. Uh, so what they do is like they uh, send somebody to a specific trap, open the trap on a certain time of the day, and return it back exactly after 24 hours, close the trap, and then uh, take the uh, mosquito samples to the lab, count uh, like uh, categorize them in terms of species, and then count exactly how many mosquitoes female mosquitoes are there in each one of the species. So you can imagine like this is a huge amount of work given 200 traps throughout the county. So they cannot do that even every single week. Uh, and another thing is like even if they can do it on a regular basis, uh, there are some accidents happens like uh, like invasion by big lizards or anything or flooded due to heavy rain. So there are a lot of cases that um, that it happened that they didn't collect any data even though they uh, they were on time there turn on 
and turn off the trap. So, like, uh, which um, the difficulty that brings is actually you wouldn't be able to have um, data point from every single trap on a very regular basis. So, if they want to do some basic statistical analysis on that kind of data point, then it's really hard for them to compare uh, the data point from one trap to another. So it's hard for you to say that which one of the locations would have more mosquito population because, for example, maybe uh, you are having like you have the data point for one location every single week uh, for one year, but uh, at the, in the same year you don't have much data point collected for the other location. So um, like uh, and. Given different years, you have different rain patterns and you have different temperature patterns. It's hard for them to compare them from trap to trap. So, um, so that's one major question. It's like they cannot directly make use of the data collected from the trap to infer mosquito populations. Uh, and another thing is like if you cannot infer the mosquito populations, how can you tell whether or not your current control strategies are working? So, um, so then like. That's where uh, they ask us for help. So, um, and then like, um, so this is, oh, like, this is a new question to us for sure because like we, before that we actually um, have zero knowledge about how to uh, incorporate model with data. Um, and we took the challenge after, uh, we actually refer to whatever people have done uh, previously, and we want to know like whether or not we can help, or is there any new, I think anything new we can contribute to. So um, just a little bit like there's hundreds of literatures out there, um, but um, but just a short summary of that is like uh, there should be currently there exists uh, there exists two ways of people looking at mosquito models as their population dynamics. So one way, which is the leading way, um, is uh, this is very, uh, like uh, this, th this kind of method is what we can summarize as intermological simulation, uh, which are usually done by, um, by ecologists. So what they do is like they really take into seriously uh, how mosquitoes might grow under different temperatures. And then they seriously count how many eggs are there, and then uh, they, they seriously consider like the weight of the mosquito population at different stages, and it's a very kind of serious entomological model way. And then uh, what they're doing, if you look at the model, is like really complicated. And uh, what they can do is like they can measure everything they know and plug it into the model so that they can make a curve of the mosquito population as their prediction over there. Uh, but the bad thing is like if they can only simulate based on their understanding about how mosquitoes are growing. And then um, and the only thing for them to validate their model is that they make use of their simulation and compare that with some observation of mosquito data. So um, so they're they're like this is a very traditional way that the ecologists would do, and they trust that this is um, this is the best way because they they, they they build up the model from the very base, basic foundation, and then uh, trying to understand how many mosquitoes are there and in that area. But uh, but this model is not that very um, it's not directly uh, related to whatever you would be able to observe in the wild because all type of parameters are measured from the experiments in the labs. So um, it wouldn't be able to reproduce everything you see in terms of different environments. So, um, so, 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 uh, so this is one type of major model that people have been doing you know, for decades. Um, and then like later on, you can see that there are differential equation models jump in. And then, uh, like uh, we were focusing on like uh, what kind of model they use, and then um, uh, how they link their model to data, or whether or not they are using data to validate their their model. So there are basically, um, you should be able to see that there are the majority of them are ordinary differential equation models because that kind of model contains less uh, model parameters, and also 
easier for you to do simulations and then um, and also in terms of mosquitoes it's easier for you to measure the temperature and stuff and everything and reflect that in the model so if you have a partial differential equation model then there are so many unknown parameter values that you cannot expect from experiment so um but there are two ways for for people to link their model to data so one way is like they use the same idea as the traditional entomological simulation so they just parameterize their model directly by whatever they know about um, how mosquitoes uh, like the rates how the rates are dependent on temperature and stuff and then they first produce their simulation curve and then uh, they just match their simulation curve to the trap data and try to validate that their model makes sense. And then, uh, but another type of model, like for example, a, a good example for, for the first type of methodology are those, like you should be able to see those are the authors coming from the ecology department. So for example, uh, this there's one group from Stanford uh, and they're doing that um, like very often and this is the major uh, methodology that they use to link their model to data um, and another type of uh, linking of model to data uh, are coming from mathematicians so so one good example is like uh, what Suzanne Lehart have been doing so so and then they are using one uh, set of ODE model and they uh, they have one set of mosquito trap data and they use the least square um, uh, uh, the least square uh, analysis to um, to, uh, to 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 be able to figure out some of the parameters over there but um, like um, but still like it's more like a, um, um, a dynamical system kind of approach because uh, they weren't able to um, take into consideration of all this kind of randomness uh, happening when you're collecting the mosquito data so um, if you're talking about least square model uh, least square analysis um, so so we think like the current trial that we can do um, we can contribute over here is just like uh, we would like to understand what's actually happening um, in our local area so we take our first initial step um, as simple as possible So we observe uh, so many ordinary differential equation models, and we see that there are some models that people take into consideration of different stages of juvenile mosquito population and stuff. And then the difficulty is like if you have a complicated differential equation model, then you're introducing so many parameters. Uh, but unluckily, the kind of um, data you have is only the mosquito trap data, which is only one dimensional uh, time series data that you have. So which will lead to some data like parameter identifiability issue uh, that I will discuss a little bit further. Uh, so that's why we get started with a very, very simple model. So we just consider two compartments of populations, just model the juvenile population and adult population, and then uh, incorporate their their birth, um, uh, birth process, death process, and developmental process in between them. And then we only model this uh, female adult mosquito population over here. And very importantly, we need to take into consideration of the temperature impact on all the kind of rates that you will see in terms of the evolution of mosquito pop, uh, mosquitoes. And then another thing, as I mentioned, like our collaborators believe that rainfall should impact the mosquito population a lot. So, uh, so we want to incorporate the rainfall effect in the model. And one way for us to do that is like, since you're talking about the ADC GPI, so if you have more in rainfalls, then, um, then you should be able to have more small water ponds filled with water. So uh, we think that may directly impact their carrying capacity for the juvenile population. So uh, we place the carrying capacity to be a parameter, uh, which is dependent on the rainfall or precipitation data. And over here, we try to do it as the traditional way. We try to figure out many of the model parameters from uh, whatever we know from ecology or entomology uh, over here so some something that you can always get from experimental study are that you can 
you you would be able to know the birth uh, like the temperature dependent birth rate and death rate and developmental rate on mosquito population from experimental data. So um, and another thing is like you can always get your temperature data, which is dependent on time, uh, from from the NOCC online website. So uh, so you should be able to incorporate everything you want to know in terms of the uh, birth and death and developmental parameters of mosquito, but you can also get some NOCC data on the rainfall for sure, uh, but you just don't know how that links to the current capacity. So that's one reason, uh, that's one thing that we want to, um, we want to model over here. Um, and talking about uh, the temperature dependent um, birth rate and death rate, um, we get the experimental data and we would be able to um, figure out the um, thermal response entomological rates of the mosquito, which you can think of like these are some of the temperature dependent parameter that you appear in the model. Um, Sorry, my computer responds really slowly when connecting to the HDMI. So, um, oh, that's out. Sorry. My bad. Um, let me reconnect the Zoom. And then I, I share the screen. Yeah, again. you just that's right. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And then what happened? Did it? Um, I my computer froze. Oh my. So um. That works. Yeah, it's just not okay. really slow. So yeah, so I let me skip this. So that's the temperature dependent thing that you can get from experimental data, and then you can make some um, assumptions on how the uh, rainfall data would impact the current capacity. So so that is like uh, you can think of really simple functions which makes you to see that more rainfall would give you more current capacity, but that and evidently um in, uh, yeah like inevitably you would be able to incorporate more unknown parameters. So that's one thing about the parameter identification problem that I will talk about again, but you are incorporating some parameters that are dependent 
on how rainfall is actually impacting the carrying capacity. So in this way, and there are other uh, things to consider from the uh, ecological co collaborators. Like one thing they are really curious about is like if like you know rainfall is going to impact, but how? So whether or not the cumulative rainfall is going to impact. And if the cumulative rainfall is going to impact the population, how many days of the cumulative rainfall you should be able to consider? And another thing is like if you have too many rainfalls, there should be a flash out effect of the mosquito public uh, for the uh, for the mosquito habitats. So then, if you have too many rainfall, then you wouldn't be able to see any newborns for the mosquito population. So these are everything that we incorporated in our model. And then we link our model to data by using the um, uh, currently very useful uh, technology of uh, M uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain um, sampling method. So the idea going on over here is just you think of that the data point that you see from the mosquito trap should follow a certain kind of uh, distribution based on whatever predicted by your model. So for example, your model predicts um, a certain number of adult female mosquito population over here. And you can assume that only a fraction of them should be able to be observed. And then for the simplest case, you can consider that maybe an average number of them predicted by the model should be able to observe by your trap based on, for example, a Poisson distribution over here. And in this way, uh, on every single day that you have a trap count, you would be able to calculate the likelihood for you to be able to observe the number of trap count on that day. And then if, like, depending on how many days you have in your observations, if you multiply all the likelihood, then that's the total likelihood you would be able to see such kind of a time series of data from one single trap. So this is the idea for the, um, so, so, so this is overall instead of a least square uh, bidding. So it's more like uh, another maximization method uh, for you to take into consideration of the randomness for you to be able to, to observe those kind of data points. So, um, and then another good thing about uh, the Monte Carlo Markov chain method for you to be able to, um, to fit your data point is that whenever they're estimating the parameter, they wouldn't be able to just give you one fixed parameter value for their estimation. So the output for this kind of simulation method is like they would be able to provide you a distribution of the possibility of your parameter values over here. So in this way, when you're making um, predictions, you no longer just predict that based on a ODE model output, which is a single line over there, but with a, like a reliable distribution of all the model parameters, your prediction would be able to incorporate a band, which incorporates all the randomness you would be able to see in the model. So, um, so this is a long, hard process uh, for you to do the this compute computer sampling by using this kind of method. Uh, but another topic which is very important that we we really uh, we really that troubles us the most is of course the parameter identifiability issue. So um, very like this is something new which we think like. Uh, people from ecology, uh, they wouldn't be able to understand it because they, uh, they, 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 don't, uh, they don't understand the model very well. But for people from mathematics, uh, we haven't been able to treat with data, so we don't know that there's this kind of problem happening over here. So the idea for the parameter identifiability is very simple. So suppose that you're just looking at the SIR model for transmission of a disease, for example. So you know that there will be um, I classes, the infected class, which will have new infections. And then you have recovered people uh, leaving this class. And also you have uh, people dying from the disease from this class. And then whenever you're parameterizing your model, you know that this is the recovery rate and this is the death rate you need to parameterize. But you will soon see that if you only have your data in terms of the infected population, um, you will see that it really doesn't matter uh, whether or not what kind of value you're taking for gamma and mu. What really matters for your model to be able to match the data is like what you have for gamma in combination of plus mu over here. 
we should know that from here, this is the prime unidentifiability problem arising from data feeding. It's just because you know that it's not if you only have one one kind of disease data over here, it's not possible for you to be able to identify every single parameter. Instead, you're actually just being able, the best thing you can do is being able to identify a combination of parameters, uh, which is related to the question um, raised by the ecological collaborators. Initially, they want us to estimate the actual mosquito population for them based on the trap data. but Due to the model uh, parameter unidentifiability issue, uh, you wouldn't be able to know the actual number of mosquito population if you only have the trapped count. So, so uh, there are certain standard methods, or uh, for example, you can do um, a parameter non-dimensionalization of the model to be able to get an infer like uh, get an idea about what kind of uh, parameter combinations you would be able to get from the uh, from this type of data and what kind of parameters would be unidentifiable. So um, so over here in this model, you would soon see that there are several unknown parameters which we mentioned before. One is related to the baseline hair capacity. That is directly related to how many mosquitoes are there actually in the wild. And another two parameters are related to the initial condition of the model. And another parameter is related to, as I mentioned before, the rainfall impact on the mosquito population. Uh, but unfortunately, after a simple analysis, you will see that only a combination of those kind of parameters can be identified. So in that way, uh, that means if you only have the track count, you would be only know that the relative population or the relative ratio in between your mosquito population in comparison to the camp capacity. And also, but the good thing is that you would be able to identify the rainfall impact if you formalize, uh, if you formalize your camp capacity function in a certain way. So, um, but like this is from um, a simple mathematical analysis results that you can already get this kind of answer. But uh, in terms for us to write a paper to be able to approve by some ecological uh, readers, like they want us to show a more um, detailed proof experimentally. So what we can do is like we also demonstrate this kind of idea by using uh, synthetic data simulation to validate this kind of feeding idea. So what we do is like very simple. You get the ODE model and you produce some ODE model output, which is called the synthetic data uh, by when we are just uh, perturbing this data based on a Poisson distribution. So it's like you're creating your own um, data set by uh, by running a model simulation over here. And then you also perturb that by based on your assumption that you're observing mosquito populations um, based on the Poisson distribution, stuff like that. And then you use this kind of synthetic data uh, to do the data fitting and try to see whether or not you can recover the model parameters you actually use in terms of generating the data. So, um, so here are some results about that, and we demonstrate that these are the only four model parameters that you would be able to know uh, from this kind of feeding method. And then also we make use of the real data as well, which is collected from several traps throughout this county. And then one trap is in Brico and one trap in Homestead. And also we have uh, traps in, um, in Miami Beach. And also um, we, have, we should have another trap from Oh, this is the trap from Braco. So then we we are we are using this kind of method. So these are the four traps uh, that we are looking at. So we look at the Winewood trap, Homestead trap, Miami Beach, and Braco. Um, and then another thing that we do for that is like you need to select your model better. So remember that you have all different different scenarios assumptions based on how your rainfall is actually impacting the mosquito population. So, and then you can do a model selection based on how well your model interprets the real data over here. So we select all, all those four different trap data from four different locations and run this kind of simulation to every single model. And you can use a certain kind of method to measure how far away your prediction is from the real data point. 
And then in this way, uh, the short answer is statistically speaking, you wouldn't be able to tell which one of the model is better. So, and the reason which is, so which is surprising to our collaborators is like, whether or not you take into consideration of the rainfall, um, it's not going to improve your model simulation to uh, your actual mosquito population trend. So, which is like really hard for them to digest, but the reason from us is uh, following. So the reason is like, if you look at the rainfall pattern and temperature pattern in our Miami-Dade County, you will see that they are, of course, exactly, they follow the exact same patterns over here. Have higher temperature in summer and you have more rainfall in summer as well. So in your model over there, you can see that your temperature pattern is already incorporated from the experimental data in your uh, mosquito population birth rate and death rate and everything over here. So it's like by using the temperature data only, you could already mimic the pattern of mosquito population trend in your model. So it's not really necessary for you to incorporate the rainfall data because they, you cannot tell exactly the number of population, but you're just interpreting the trend. So, but a good, uh, good exercise for us to uh, double check with this hypothesis is, of course, if you have any mosquito data from another location, which they have different patterns of rainfall and temperature, you would be able to answer this. Uh, but based on whatever happening in Miami Dade, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be able to see the impact of the rainfall on the trend of mosquito population. Um, and really short, I, I don't have time, I'm sorry for that uh, because of the computer trouble, but really short in terms of real application of the model is that going back to the idea that we were asked to compare mosquito population from different uh, traps locations over there. So you can make use of the same idea by putting one assumption on the, um, on the pro proportion ratio for you to be able to observe the mosquito population based on a trap efficiency and then you would be able to link all your trap um, data and being able to fit that to like uh, one uh, system of ordinary differential equation so and in this way you would be able to similarly compare uh, relatively uh, which trap has more mosquito population in this way and then uh, in this way you will see that surprisingly Miami Beach has the least number of mosquito population, uh, but um, but a homestead and Winewood have more number of mosquito population, which is interesting uh, related back to the Zika outbreak. Remember that Miami Beach is the location that discovered most Zika cases, and then you see that uh, uh, it's counterintuitive that you see that Miami Beach didn't have the most mosquito population. It even have less mosquito population, but it it is the epicenter of the Zika outbreak, uh, which means that whether or not there's an outbreak of Zika may not be dated back to the actual mosquito population. It should be related in terms of the interaction between human and mosquito. So the contact rate really matters, it's not the mosquito. So, um, and also you can, of course, assess the rainfall impact factor. That means like whether or not rainfall really matters in terms of the mosquito population in different locations. And um, results make sense. You see that rainfall matters with the mosquito population in Miami Beach the most, uh, which coincides with their understanding because the ADC Gypti, the species of mosquito, um, they only breed on small containers. And in Miami Beach, you have more people and you have more abandoned small containers, such as beer cans and stuff and garbage cans. And then, um, and then that rainfall matters uh, very much for that. And of course, the advantage for you to have a ODE model um, or differential equation model is like you can always simulate all different kind of uh, treatment strategy, vector control strategies uh, for mosquito population. And then you can tell them like which one of the vector control st strategy or in which intensity of the control strategy are, will give you the optimal result for that. But there are some discussions interesting on that part as well. But uh, what I want to mention is like this is only a very simple project, but we've learned so much from that. This is only the starting point. 
of an even more better approach to by making use of this data. So from the computational point of view, um, this method is not long enough because it's like computationally very expensive. So if you're just analyzing for trap data, that already takes you a number of days in terms of fitting. Um, so this is not the optimal strategy for you to be able to analyze all 200 trap counts. And then uh, one way for us to do that is like you may be able to um, use some inverse method from ODE models so that uh, you can, based on the trap count, and then you would be able to infer some time-dependent variables from the ODE. And then in terms of that, you can incorporate more factors that you think would matter with the mosquito population. And maybe using some machine learning models, very simple machine learning models, to be able to predict some model parameters that are dependent on time. And then that's one way that we are trying. And another thing that uh, which is really important, as I mentioned, uh, whether or not you would have an outbreak may not be dependent on the mosquito population number. So, uh, so, and what's more important is the interaction model. So, or the uh, disease transmission model that you incorporate human and mosquito. And also, what's more important also would uh, depending on the timing of the introduction of the first case and also the timing of the mosquito biting pattern as well. So, and in terms of that, you may want to look at a structured model uh, that into take into consideration of the mosquito age and human infection age and stuff like that. And in terms of that, you would have different time scales in terms of the disease progression and mosquito life cycle as well. And in terms of that, you may be want to wondering to analyze some slow fast system and considering like how um, how different mosquito control strategy would eventually impact the disease outbreak. So I'm sorry for the technical issue, and I'm apparently late for uh, ending my talk. And then uh, if, I, if you have any like really quick questions, I would be happy to answer. And happy birthday again.